Your body's like having a three-year-old with you all the time. And if you feed a three-year-old and get a three-year-old enough sleep and take the three-year-old outside to play and you may, and they can actually pay attention for long periods of time and self-entertain for long periods of time. But if you don't feed them and you don't have a schedule and you don't tell them what's going to happen, they are going to make your lives hell. <laughs> and, and our body does like our body. When we're uncomfortable, our body's trying to say, hey, you, you missed something that I actually needed. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today, we have a fascinating conversation with Dr. Kristen Allett, naturopathic doctor who has decades of clinical experience in curbing anxiety and panic attacks with a simple hack. No, this is not clickbait. This is actually a simple hack that she came up with over the years through her clinical practice that actually worked with her patients. And it could potentially work for you too. A little bit about Dr. Kristen Allett. She's a naturopathic physician, national speaker, and pioneering advocate for the use of whole foods nutrition in the treatment of mental health disorders. Dr. Allett is passionate about achievable results. With more than a decade of clinical experience, she has redefined her expertise on how to promote increased mental health functioning by treating the physical causes of mental health, fatigue, and sugar cravings. Dr. Allett regularly presents at psychiatric nurse practitioner conventions and non-pharmaceutical interventions for mental health. Additionally, she consults with the Court Improvement Training Academy in Washington State to develop the Protein for All project to optimize brain function in the high stakes environment of juvenile and family court systems in the state of Washington. Stay tuned for our conversation with Dr. Kristen Allen. Dr. Kristen Allen, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here. Thank you so much, Drew. I'm so excited for this conversation. I think it'll be uh, just a fun uh, back and forth to share information. Yeah, I love what you're bringing to the world in this topic of anxiety. And I think that if we zoom out in the context of the current world, even prior to COVID-19 pandemic, anxiety, you could see that the instances and usage of the word in just general language, newspaper, social media is skyrocketing. And you know, language is so powerful. And sometimes we really have to parse apart a word to really understand, like, what do we really mean when we're saying that? Because sometimes we say anxiety and we actually could be meaning something else. So when you talk about this world of anxiety and your new book, which we're going to get into in a little bit, what do you really want people to help understand of what exactly is anxiety? Yeah. So I think that's a great question. And I will just tell you how I approached that um, when I started in practice about 15 years ago, because um, I'm a naturopathic physician, acupuncturist, and decided to specialize in mental health. And uh, people were coming in and saying, I'm anxious. And and I just didn't think that that it was like, so how does that apply to physiology was really the question that I was interested in. And um, because so for some people it's stress, for some people it's I'm afraid to move forward and take a step forward. For some people it's uh, I'm overwhelmed. Like there's all sort, you know, it's a catchword as you you say. And and but there's also uh, I'm curious about what the physiology of uh, depression or anxiety or whatever these words were saying and. And so I, uh, when I started in practice, I, I literally in my, on my living room floor, I had a stack of physiology textbooks, a, a stack of neurology textbooks, and the DSM. And the DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And it just describes what the diagnosis categories for, for anxiety are. And, and I was just like, well, I, you know, I think it's more than just an emotion. Like it can be. But like the people who are coming in with panic attacks, like that is not an emotion. That is a full embodied experience, right? And um, and so I started just parsing out like what are the what are the physi what physiology causes these physical symptoms of shaking and racing thoughts and your heart racing and maybe you're sweating and 
and, and all those symptoms that, uh, you know, sometimes it starts small and then it e escalates to really big Absolutely. and sta started to parse that out. And then was like, well, once, once I started to understand the physiology and the neurophysiology, well, where do we, where can we intervene to help people feel better? And, and so, so Oh, I don't ahead, know please. if that's answering your question. It's kind of copying out, but it's like that's that's the approach that I took because so many people were using words, and I was like, I want to ground it in something concrete. Absolutely. I mean, if we look at the history and evolution of just anxiety and a lot of mental health, a lot of these things in early medicine were considered to be um, they're kind of in your head, right? Like yeah. nothing else is going on. Right. And we made a documentary a few years ago, which then led to the name of this podcast, Broken Brain. My uh, business partner and dear friend, Dr. Mark Hyman, we made a documentary called Broken Brain. And the underlining premise of that documentary was what you do to your body, you do to your brain. Your brain is not right. this isolated right. organ that just is floating on top of your head that's completely disconnected right. from the rest of everything that's going on. They're actually an intertwined system. And yeah. so we have to understand that, yes, there can be, let's call it for lack of a better term, emotional factors that are there, right? Stress sure. is the complete driver of so many different things that we feel, but Let's also look at the physiology of what's right. happening underneath. So when it comes to that topic of anxiety and the physiology, I want to ask you a question, which is a question that I came across a few years ago in um, a book by uh, Peter Thiel, a little bit of a controversial character, but you know, I really love this question that he had inside of this book. I think the book is called Zero to One. And he said, what truth do you believe is true that other people disagree with in that category. So when you look at anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. What do you believe is true when you think about anxiety and physiology that other people, maybe traditional Western medicine would say like, I don't know if that's true. Yeah. So uh, the one truth that I see time and time again is it is really hard to have a panic attack if you just ate. And I don't see panic attacks occur unless people are five hours from food or more. And, or they may have eaten some really sugary substance two, at two hours ago. But if you had a real meal, it is really hard to have a panic attack. That's powerful right there. And, and people are like, that is not true. And, and the same applies to suicidal ideation which is, you know, just part of the spectrum. If people keep doing, doing panic attacks, they can get there. And, 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 and the reason for that is that our, I mean, I can go into the physiology, but, but people don't believe that until they lo start looking mental health professionals or physicians. And then when they want start looking at the pattern, it holds true. Now there's always an exception to the rule always, but it holds like 95% true. Yeah. And anxiety is a spectrum. And obviously there's always going to be outliers and different things of extreme sure. anxiety. That's also connected to other yeah. challenges and disorders. Even having vast gaps in your microbiome could make you more of an anxious person that's there. Sure. But with what you're writing about and what I've went through in your workbook uh, that's now out, uh, fuel your brain, not your anxiety. It's really about like that chunk in the middle for the person that's out there. It's like, I regularly go through anxiety yeah. And I'm looking for solutions to jump into it. So let's actually dissect that a little bit further. And let's talk about that. What does eating and when we eat and, and, and what we eat have to do with anxiety? Yeah. So uh, just to put into context that when I started, my clinical practice was mostly people with complex PTSD. So lots of history of trauma, very anxious. Uh, and lots of people in recovery. So, so usually giving up alcohol or marijuana, those kind of drugs. Um, and so, you know, pretty vulnerable brains and really anxious people, right? Because they had a history of just bad things happening in their lives. And as I was looking at the physiology, what, what we know from neuro neurobiology is that the amygdala which is part of our limbic system and is our part of our survival system. If we have a history of trauma or repeat anxiety events, 
that part of our brain gets more receptors for that are scanning for adrenaline and or norepinephrine and epinephrine, right? And so the this this survival part of our brain that controls anxiety is hyper vigilant to bad things, which makes sense, right? When we go too long without eating or our blood sugar is crashing because we ate something that has a lot of sugar in it, part of the cocktail that is released in the body, the cocktail of hormones to stabilize that blood sugar or keep our blood sugar up is adrenaline. And so, so when we go four or five hours without eating, there, n- n- nothing, and, and we're sitting in a room reading a book, whatever, nothing exciting is going on. Adrenaline is starting to bleed into our system. When there's adrenaline in the system, all of our sensory information goes from from our prefrontal cortex, our responsive smart brain, into our limbic system. And our limbic system, its only job is to keep us alive. Not happy, not, not suffering, but physically alive. And so it, when it starts to get any adrenaline, may it be because of, because a bear walked in the room, like we know why we have an adrenaline rush when a bear walks in the room, right? And we're gonna be like, ah, this happened, blah, blah, blah. But when we go too long without eating, we don't know why we're getting anxious. And we don't even know that our smart brain is is being put in the back seat and our front, our our survival brain that's gonna differentiate, like, should I run from it? Should I fight it? Should I disappear and go la 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 or into Ben and Jerry's ice cream or alcohol or marijuana or Facebook or whatever it is? And at that same moment in that uh, survival part of our system is let's use something that helped us survive in the past that has, that may or may not be useful in the present moment, right? Whatever that survival tool, which in itself, when our brain's like, hey, you should really yell at your partner because that was really effective in childhood because your parents, you know, your parents uh, use that and, and your partner has been really clear that you, you don't like to be yelled at, <laughs> you're, you know, like that creates anxiety, right? Cause you're using old material that, that you don't want to use and your responsive brain, your adult brain ha- has been put in the backseat. And when you think about the evolutionary drivers of that, would you say that that adrenaline, which is coming in to sort of help balance everything out is really a sort of biological tool that we have of like, pay attention, be alert. You need to go solve this and address the the food. Like we need food. We need something because we're at risk. Right. And it, it, it was a brilliant physiological mechanism 5,000 years ago, right? Yeah. Because like if we were under threat, it was because something was trying to kill us or we were fighting somebody else, or we were hunting, or, you know, like, and, and we needed a lot of physical adrenaline in our body to respond. I'm, I'm a martial artist, I'm a fourth degree black belt. And, and so I've studied this, right. And like, when, when you're going at it with somebody who is bigger than you or stronger than you, it is really good to have adrenaline in the system right? Because it, it gets blood to your, to your quads and your arms and, and get your heart rate racing and all of those things, right? That that's useful. But if you're having a really important conversation with your boss or you're, you're, you're in court or you have an interview where you have to have your body sit really quietly and your brain is what's doing all the action. We need to be in our smart brain. We don't need to be in our lizard brain. This brilliant tool, you know, our body is so brilliant and everything it does for largely, I mean, extreme genetic um, mistakes are so rare, really. Most of the stuff that our body does, even a lot of what we see as disease, especially through the lens of naturopathic and functional medicine is really just our body trying to survive. We think of it as a bad thing, but it's like our body's just doing what it's trying to do. We just don't aren't putting in the right inputs based right. on how we evolved. So this so this, you know, zooming out, there's this beautiful evolutionary technique that our body did which was designed for our survival, which probably was a little bit less 
often use when we were on the Sahara in the right. Africa, in Africa right. on you know the plains. But now today, let's talk about why this mechanism is being kind of hijacked today and is completely out of control. What are the modern day factors that are taking place where this thing that our body did on purpose is now actually harming us and really making it difficult for us to function in our day-to-day lives? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it's a couple of reasons. One, 5,000 years ago, getting hold of carbohydrates was hard, right? Like, and, and, and they weren't even carbohydrates. I mean, maybe they were fruit or tubers. Tubers, right? Right. right? And, and so like, and how many of us are like, wow, I got to eat an orange today. Like, I'm, I'm going to go, you know, like we're like cupcakes, right? And licorice, right? And, and fruit is, was also like super seasonal. You couldn't really get it all the time. Right? Right. right. It would be around sometimes. And, and I guess, uh, you know, just one other thing I'd add inside of sure. there is that for some modern day hunter gatherer groups, depending on region, sometimes honey, right. That would be the right. most concentrated form that they would have access to. Right. And, and it was precious, right? Precious. Exactly. Like you did not sit down and eat a thousand calories of sugar which we, or, I, I don't know about you. I or, can do that. Easy. <laughs> I, I just want to, I want to stress test that idea a little bit, or if you did, then you weren't having anything for maybe weeks to months at a time. Right. There does seem that there is some archeological evidence of people and even some today, modern day hunter gatherer societies, like they get a honeycomb, which takes a lot of work. You're getting yeah. stung. It's yeah, not an yeah. easy thing. Yeah. You, you get this thing and then they might gorge on it for that time period, but they don't have that the next day or the next day or the next day. It could be another month before they have that. Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at just, so there's two parts, we're going to look at carbohydrates and then we're going to look at what, how proteins are different. So carbohydrates, we, we like, when I do public talks, I'm like, I want you, all of you to raise your hand if you have a carb source in your vicinity right now. And like, two thirds of the room raises their head because they got candy, they got protein bars, they've got something, right? Like immediately there, right? Which is biologically unusual. Um, And uh, so when we eat carbohydrates, our our blood glucose is gonna go up and then insulin, which I think is like one of the coolest hormones because it's our only really good storage hormone. It's the one that knocks on the cells and says, hey, we got fuel, do you want it? And the cells open it up and get it in, right? And so insulin is going to get released from the pancreas and is going to lower the blood glucose. When we have just a carb source, such as like bread or scones or cereal, like we usually have for breakfast, our prefrontal cortex has fuel for about two hours. And, and, and that's a really individual thing. So I'm not saying that people are hypoglycemic. I'm saying that they don't have enough glucose for their prefrontal cortex to be comfortable to do the amount of thinking that they have to do. And, 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 and it's that drop. And so I'm not so interested in like the technical form of hypoglycemia. So 65 grams per deciliter. So low blood glucose, I'm interested in how quickly is your blood glucose dropping after it initially spikes up from having after it initially spikes up, because I think the body's paying attention to that. And I have a lot of clinical evidence that that's what the body's paying attention to. Cause like I had a group of Microsoft women who are at these high performance jobs, right? And they, they're, they're accounting to me that they can be sitting on the couch watching a program and start to get really anxious and there is nothing going on. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I think it's hypoglycemia. And so they got, they got a glucometer and they tested their blood and they're like, it's 95. That isn't even close to low. And I'm like, no, it's not close to low, but for you to perform at Microsoft, it has to be higher than 95. And can I ask you a question about yeah. that? Just unpack that. Um, yeah. So I wear a continuous glu- glucose monitor. Oh, um, I'm so jealous. I can't yeah. have like, well, that's I'll get my you next- one. We have uh, oh. friends. We had Dr. Ben Bickman and Dr. Casey Means from this company Levels on the podcast. Yeah. Really sweet people. Oh. And they've made some incredible software to kind of like help you yeah. interpret. So I'll send you one. We'll get you okay. on. We'll yeah, get yeah. you on one. Um, so I wear a continuous glucose monitor. So I'm seeing my sort of blood glucose throughout the day yeah. and I see kind of the optimal range that I'm, you know, trying to be in. 
So going back to that story of that, uh, you know, female executive yeah. at Microsoft yeah. who's just sitting on her couch, you know, working from home and trying to manage kids and work and all that other oh stuff that comes along with it yeah. and make, and reminding to like eat in the first place. Right. So she could be at, let's say a 95, but I'm, I guess my, the question is, you're saying it has to be higher for her to function there, but it, is it also based on sort of what else she ate throughout the day and how stable her blood sugar has been or not been? It's that, so I think it's two places and, and, you know, in the next five years, I'll be really confident of my answer. And I am because of continuous glucose monitors, but what I see with just glucose monitors is that it is the, the, um, as the blood clue, the, the rate that the blood glucose is dropping that makes the brain concerned for itself. Right. So she was, she may be 95 now, but she was, let's say 150 for right. lunch because she was eating pasta, right. just creating a narrative or exactly. something else. So even though she's 95, she's not seeing the downward trend, which is you are crashing now. You you are crashing fast now. You're crashing fast. And I think you're, I'm not trying to plug levels. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. anything yeah, like yeah. that. But I think one thing that you're going to love about this is that with an app like this, and these are like former Airbnb, yeah. Apple guys, yeah. uh, and then Dr. Casey Means, when they see your glucose crash in the app, they put a giant question mark at the bottom and say, what the hell just happened before this? Exactly. That led to this dip. So she caught it in a moment in time. But what you're really saying is that if she could see the whole day, she was on the roller coaster ride. She was on the roller coaster. And now her body's getting anxious because she's it's freaking out and saying, holy shit, our survival right. as risk, the limbic brain is click kicking in the lizard brain, as right. we sometimes right. call it. Right. Yeah. It's like, you need to get anxious and pay attention and go out there and like figure something out. Figure something out because something bad is about to happen, mm. right? Right? Like, and, and we're going to go and nothing bad's happened in their living room, right? Like it's all okay. But the, their, their heart is starting to race. Their palms are starting to sweat. The, all the, you know, their mind is starting to race or, or, you know, kind of pick on something that they're nervous about where they were fine 30 minutes earlier. Right. And, and these symptoms of anxiety and they and they get fearful because they know if it goes too long, then they're going to work themselves into a panic attack and they don't want to go there. Right. Nobody wants to go there. And so what, so that's the first piece on what I see happening is that we're not tracking what we're actually eating. We're just eating a lot of carbohydrates. Right. And we can go a little more into that, but the other piece that is a part of this. So this, let me do the solution first and then come back to why we have to do the solution. So what I see is that when people eat protein with carbs um, throughout the day, so like protein for breakfast and then three hours later, a snack with protein in it and three hours later. So they're eating protein throughout the day with carbs, fiber, fat, you know, just small frequent meals that stabilizes the blood glucose so that they're not dropping into their limbic system and makes make and that makes a big difference in terms of their overall anxiety, their overall fatigue. They have better mental clarity because they're not washing away their GABA every time they get hypoglycemic. So getting hypoglycemic, we lose a lot of GABA. Uh, the neurotransmitter GABA, because the GABA is like, oh, we got to stabilize like all this anxiety. And so, so when people are not very conscious about their meals, they can get into trouble about what they're eating. And there's just a lot, there's just a lot of mixed messages about that. The other piece in terms of the physiology is that 5,000 years ago, we were using our body a lot. I mean, obviously people didn't eat every three hours, 5,000 years ago. Like th there was just we not just enough. We just didn't have the luxury to. <laughs> we didn't have the luxury to, nor did we need to because we were using our body all the time. And when we move our body, we are doing a couple of the things. We are releasing brain derived neurotropic factor, which stabilizes our brain, but we are also ripping our muscle mass. So even if we're only eating protein a couple of times in the day, we are flushing amino acids into the system so that 
our liver has protein to make glucose out of. And so when I see people get have movement practices throughout the day and they're getting a lot of exercise, they are not as dependent upon protein, but most of us are pretty sedentary. And so for people who have mental health problems and anxiety and fatigue and depression, what I see as a better diet, it is eating protein with carbs throughout the day yeah. to stabilize the blood glucose. Yeah. I would love to unpack that because, you know, there's, there's a lot of what you shared that is going to be a little bit new to some of our listeners where we've kind of dig, dug into this. So I want to make sure we give it the appropriate love and attention. I would love that to, to dig into it. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to add that, uh, you know, the beauty of you being in clinical practice is that you're testing these things out with your patients all the time. And yeah. so even if somebody hears something that is maybe not what they're currently doing, but they still feel like it's working for them is like, these are coming from, you know, people who are really struggling with, you know, some form of anxiety, which is what you've specialized in, but I'm sure you've had light anxiety pe folks sure, too, sure. too on the light side. But the beauty of it is, is that clinical evidence, you know, one form of research is a clinical trial, but clinical evidence is another form of research too. So yeah. this is you doing and yeah. giving something for people to try. I always thought that if I ever write a book, it'd be like, try this and, or in the subtitle would be maybe, which is that you have <laughs> yeah. to try and you have to see actually for you, which is why, where, for instance, for me, I, I actually prefer to do a big breakfast, not eat anything in that time. And I do have, you know, a lot of vegetables inside of there, mm -hmm. good quality proteins. And I don't really eat a lot of refined carbs, especially because I can see the impact that it makes on my continuous yeah. glucose monitor. Yeah. Um, and then because my blood sugar is so stable, I don't actually genuinely feel hungry. And usually my mental health feels pretty good as well. Yeah. Where I think what you're sharing is, is very interesting is that I do work out pretty much four days a week, like a 30 minute, you know, pretty in high intensity workout in the morning. Yeah. And I think that as we are trying to be realistic with what, how people are living and what they're doing, even if evolutionarily, we didn't necessarily come from that. It's another tool in the toolbox, especially if anybody's listening here and is still struggling with even light level anxiety and feels like they have yeah. not been able to figure out a solution. Yeah. So let me turn this into a question. Sure. So generally, my understanding is that when both from seeing my response and everybody responds differently to different sure. foods, but my understanding of the literature is that when we eat, especially if we're not eating a highly processed, highly refined carb carbohydrate rich meal, yeah. and we're eating slow carbs and vegetables and things yeah. like that and good quality protein, yeah. our blood sugar should sort of have that spike when you eat yeah. naturally, just like when you yeah. work out, you spike your blood sugar. Yep. Yeah. And then we kind of come down to, to like a level, like we have a little blip yeah. and then we kind of yeah. come down based on how much yeah. total our, our glucose has been Im impacted. If I would imagine that if I'm eating or somebody's eating six times a day, is that a lot of up and up and down? Because each time they eat, they're going to spike their blood glucose, right? Yeah. But are you saying that they just eat, need to eat just enough to kind of keep it at a certain level? Yeah. yeah. So it really depends. So I treat people where they're at. So if somebody's like, I'm eating at the drive through at McDonald's every, every meal, I'm like, awesome. Let's start there and let's make one little, and I like how you're talking about doing experiments. Let's do one little experiment and see if you feel better and one little experiment and see if you feel better. So you're always treating like what the food sources somebody has. But one of the things that I teach them is if you graph and we're going to get better at this with continuous group close monitor. But if you have like uh, a, a glass of orange juice and that's it, your blood glucose is going to spike and come, come down really quickly. Right. And if you have a piece of jerky, your blood glucose is actually going to have stay pretty flat. And then about an hour later, you're gonna, your liver is going to convert the, the protein into glucose and you're going to get a little up of a glucose. And if you put fiber in there, like, um, uh, like an apple, right? Rarely do you have fiber without any, any, I mean, I suppose you could just do like Metamucil or like, um, 
flax, right? or something. flax, and you're going to get nothing, nothing off of that or not much. I mean, maybe the, the biome's going to do something with it, but you're not going to get anything. But if you take an apple rather than a sharp spike, you're going to get a little slower. And so you're going to get an hour, an hour and a half of blood glucose. And so what I'm trying to do by having people eat small little meals with it is is get the just this are the slow roll going um which is helping them what i see consistently cl clinically is then they don't crave carbohydrates because they're not you know we're going to crave carbohydrates like, like crazy when our blood glucose is dropping because our body knows it's a solution and then we get into these peak, peaks and valleys kind of thing and so having people just focus on the protein because protein is like the log on the fire and the carbohydrates is like the kindling and the newspaper. And so you need a little bit of both unless you're in keto. And then that's a whole other discussion. Right. And we can go there, but like the, the, for the people that I'm working with, and I appreciate that you're like, there's sort of low level anxiety people. And then there's pretty high level anxiety people and people who are still working through trauma who can easily get triggered environmentally, who have a lot of emotional challenges, um, who uh, if they restrict their diet too much are gonna feel deprived and that's gonna set a whole bunch of other things going on. I, you know, doing, um, doing or, or, or encouraging perfectionism. I mean, I think your diet's great, but as long as you're not doing it to be perfect, right? Because, <laughs> you know, perfectionism gets us into all sorts of things. Absolutely. And so, so people who, who can do those diets are great. I, I have not clinically had a lot of people come in who are eating mostly whole foods diets and come in and, and are, um, are do and who aren't. So if they're eating whole foods diets, they tend to be more depressed and they're still on the low protein end of things rather than a normal protein um, level. I don't you, know. No, that makes absolute sense. I mean, I'll just repeat back to you what I'm getting because I yeah. think, you know, just for the yeah, audience's yeah. sake and my own sake to make yeah. sure I understand you clearly is that, you know, when we started off the beginning part of the conversation, you were really talking about serving an underserved population, addiction in some cases, you know, having worked a little bit with that population. Yeah. And then maybe even someone like sometimes an overlooked population, people that have already tried different solutions. Yeah. And when you can find yourself, even though it's a broad spectrum, when you can find yourself at a place where you are struggling with addiction, for example, or other components, maybe these people aren't your traditional wellness warriors who have been studying this and right. like are trying to put, you know, tons of attention, energy, not that they can't suffer too, but you're trying to meet them where they're at because they're just trying to make it through the day. And right. when they're just trying to make it through the day and they're maybe not eating, I don't think there is an ideal yeah. way to eat, right? A moral yeah. ideal way to eat. When they're not eating quote unquote, ideally, you are looking at what is a solution that I can come in and bring that even if it's not quote unquote perfect or is yeah. the exact blood glucose mapping that we want during right. the day, really it's a hack to address specifically this anxiety because I've, if I can't help them get this anxiety under, for lack of a better term, control or less right. reactionary, then they're not going to be able to be a good human being, be kind to themselves, be kind to other people and actually make good judgment call because your brain, your frontal lobe can only do that executive function when you're not in this crazy, how do I survive? How do I survive? Which is what happens yeah. to folks who are crashing. So if this is simply a hack to begin the journey for people and yeah. not get in that place of, you know, crazy levels of anxiety, and it works as you've seen from a clinical standpoint, then like we need to get more people on this. Absolutely. I agree with everything you said, except for that this is a subpopulation because this physiology is the same physiology of people who have obesity, which is a, at least 50% of America. And right now we are all going through a trauma and the number of people who are reporting gaining weight and eating more sugar and drinking more alcohol, we are all doing, we are trying to treat the 
get out of our limbic system with the thing that we know will get us out of our limbic system. Because when we have sugar or we have alcohol, 20 minutes later, we get, a, we get more tryptophan into our, our, past our blood brain barrier. We get a serotonin hit, which tells our lizard brain, hey, everything's okay. Everything's not okay right now. Like it is really not okay to have kids in the background while you're trying to be a business professional or any kind of professional, right? And, and what we know is, and, and we don't know that, but we intuitively know that sugar will make that feel better, except for two hours later, we're going to be hitting that adrenaline button. And guess what we're going to want again? Sugar. And then we're going to hit our adrenaline button. And then we're going to hit our adrenaline button. And we're going to feel guilty because we're like, oh, we're eating sugar all the time. But nobody's saddled up and said, what if you focus on protein? What if you just make sure that you're getting protein at breakfast and protein at lunch and protein at dinner? And if you want to have a snack, you can have whatever your sugar snack is, but get a spoonful of peanut butter or a handful of nuts or a scoop of cottage cheese. Like have, have your candy. I don't care, but get the protein in. And what happens is the blood glucose levels out and people don't do the sugar cycle as hard. And when I'm hearing you say protein, right, you're talking about sugar and you're talking about protein, but inside of that protein, it's kind of like protein and also some of the dis descriptions you gave, it's kind of like protein and fat, right? It's protein and fat, you know, like healthy me, fats. Yeah. For me, a meal is protein, some kind of identifiable carb, uh, some kind of fat and some kind of fiber because the fiber is usually fruit or vegetable, which is our multivitamin. I want to pivot from there to, to talk about another example, and then we'll get into the details of like, how does this all work and yeah, how yeah, you work yeah. on it with your patients and stuff. One of the things that people notice where their anxiety flares up the highest is right as they're trying to go to bed. That is a yeah. moment where people feel like their mind is sort of super active, or in some cases, people fall asleep a little bit, and then they, they wake up in the middle of the night, and there's just sort of anxiety that they're going through yeah. in whatever way that they want to describe it. Um, have you seen that in your patients and how do you talk about that with people? Yeah. So I'm so glad you bring that up. So in terms of going to sleep, one of the things that I talk to my patients about is that they should know about their, their sleep clock. And so um, there, there's a pulse of melatonin that starts happening in the evening. And we've all had this experience where it's like 6.30 at night and we're kind of like doing our thing. And all of a sudden we're like, whoa, I am so tired. And five minutes later, you're fine. Like, right. And then an hour, 45 minutes to an hour and a half later, you're going to get this other, next pulse. And you're like, oh, and then, and then you're fine and even a little more energized, right? And so for me, mine's an hour and a half. And so like the first time it's going to show up about 730. And the next time it's going to show up is about nine o'clock. Right. And so, so, and then 1030. And for me to just like go to sleep, because I'm a horrible sleeper in general, like my husband has a super power of sleeping. I do not. And, and so either I have my head on the pillow at nine o'clock and I am ready to go to bed when that pulse shows up and I can just sleep right into going to sleep or it's 1030. Now, if I want to go to bed before that, like, I just know that I'm just going to have to lay there and my brain's going to be like, la, 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 la. and I'm just like, shh, shh, shh. you know, I'm just, it's like a meditation, right? Like, you're just like, be quiet. We're just laying here because some, I like to just let my body rest. And I just know that, but to pay attention to that pulse. And I'm sure you've talked about this with other, other people is like, you got to get away from screens for at least 30 minutes, if not an hour, because they're so stimulating. Yeah. yeah screens and, and, and also we've had some folks in the past talk about also like turning off like these overhead lights and maybe keeping, you know, more like a lamp on just like kind yeah. of quieting down the whole thing. Yeah. Quieting down so that like y your body knows that, that it's time to go to bed and having rituals. So for me, I, I grew up on a farm and so you shower before you go to bed because you're dirty and you know, like you got dirt all over the place and, and I just stayed in that habit. So when I travel to the East coast to do speaking, like I take a shower and my body's like, are you sure it's bedtime? 
like, okay, <laughs> you know, and because it's like she only showers or takes a bath when it's bedtime, and it's like, okay, we'll speed up and we'll catch up with you, and then I'll just go to sleep, right? And so having, and it's like when you have little kids, like you create a sleep ritual, and I often talk to my clients as though. I say your body's like having a three-year-old with you all the time. And if you feed a three-year-old and get a three-year-old enough sleep and take the three-year-old outside to play and you may, and they can actually pay attention for long periods of time and self-entertain for long periods of time. But if you don't feed them and you don't have a schedule and you don't tell them what's going to happen, they are going to make your lives hell. <laughs> and, and our body does like our body when we're uncomfortable, our body's trying to say, hey, you, you missed something that I actually needed. And so, so creating some kind of ritual around going to sleep so that your body's hormones, which are the messenger system of the body, knows like we that we got to get these hormones going so that she'll go to sleep or he'll go to sleep. So as I was studying these, what happens when adrenaline is released and glucose is released, one of the patterns that I saw is that people would wake up in the middle of the night for two hours and their brains would be racing and they like they get woken up and they might be anxious or it's just their brains talking or they just can't go to sleep. And I was like, well, what if that's also the blood glucose getting too low? Because our brain's super busy without us at night. Like our, the, our, we sleep for eight hours for a reason because our brain needs that time of us not being around, right? And so it needs a fuel supply. And so what I started doing was asking people, I, I call lizard brain treat, uh, like a quarter cup of juice and a handful of nuts, not, you know, not a lot of carbohydrates, but just a quick carb to get the blood glucose and get the up and the adrenaline turned off and then a slow burning fuel. I was like, why don't you just put juice and nuts right by the bed stand and see if it'll help you go back to sleep, uh, you know, faster than two hours. And I would say it's about 70% successful in terms of helping people go, go back to sleep. And the other thing that I will have them do, which really breaks all the dietary rules out there is I will have them eat a little bit of protein right before they go to bed. And it'll, and it'll, I, I'm like, just put in protein so that your body is, it's like, here's the protein that you, you need to eat. Don't eat off my muscle mass. Cause it takes adrenaline to pull it, pull it off of our body. Right. Just put it in and go to sleep. And I, um, last time could I, I, could I just ask, uh, like about yeah. when you say a little bit of protein, yeah. how many grams of protein and what would like, be an example? Uh, uh, a slice of turkey, a slice spoon, of turkey, you know, oh. eight grams, not, not a ton. Like it's not yeah. a meal and it's just some straight protein, like a spoonful of nut butter, a slice of turkey, call it good. And, uh, there's two things that I see that happen, happen with, with that, or I use it clinically is for people who are waking up at to a, like two or 3 a.m. with their heads racing, right? And sometimes that prevents them from waking up so they don't have to lose, use the lizard brain treat. But the other thing that it really helps with is for people who are having PTSD nightmares. Mm. Uh, and I, I've had numerous people are like, I've had 30 years of nightmares and like eating protein before I go to bed, like I stop having those nightmares, which just changes somebody's life, right? Absolutely. And, and, uh, and the last time before COVID shut everything down, there was a woman who said she had never slept through the night that she could ever recall call. And she ate protein before she went to bed and, uh, slept through the night. And she was like, that was just the most weird experience in my life that like, and I feel awesome today. Yeah. I mean, the reason I wanted to bring it up is that because it is something that you talk about in the book and it's also sometimes counterintuitive to some things that people hear. So but like, but like a lot of areas when you're struggling, you want to be thinking about, you know, if somebody's listening to your voice, they're hearing the genuineness that you're coming and sharing. They're hearing the science that you're presenting. They're hearing your clinical experience with patients. It's like, Hey, if I'm still struggling with this, maybe I should try this, right? Maybe I can try right. this and see if it makes a difference. For me, right. yes, again, we all have our version of like what is ideal or what components are there, but real life and also probably evolution is like, let's do what works, let's bring it in. Right. And because our diets and our lifestyles, we have to remember that 
we are also, you know, I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and I know exactly why it is. My, in my blood sugar is very stable. Is like, I get too hot. Right. Ah, right. Right. Even sleeping in the same bed with somebody, that's actually a very modern phenomenon. People didn't used to actually share a bed and they didn't have the same duvet. So our life is very different than it was in the past. Yeah. I try to counteract that by having like a chili pad and other things yeah. to like, you know, try to yeah. keep the bed cool, keep the windows open. So I'm not stuffy. I have all my little try to tricks that I do. Yeah. But in general, I guess my point that I'm making is that be open-minded, especially when you're still going through challenges with something and forget yeah. all the rules and try stuff, even if you think that it's different advice and actually see if it works. So going back to sort of your workbook, what you teach your patients, if they're trying this sort of protein, mm -hmm. minimizing the carbs and some of the other suggestions in your book, being aware of your sleep cycle and some other things we'll get to, how long do you think typically before somebody starts to see if it's making a difference for them? Three days. There you go. Like, so I most typically I have, and this is why I wrote the book, is most patients who come to see me, I'm like, we go through everything. I want to make sure that this is, this is the right experiment, but I get what their diet is. And generally they're having like toast for breakfast and a salad with not nearly enough protein for lunch. And then, then a piece of meat with a whole bunch of potatoes for lunch, for dinner. Right. And and I'm like, okay, let's eat protein every three hours. You don't have, this isn't forever. This is for three days. And we want to see how much your symptoms improve. And the two metrics that we're going to use is what is your anxiety and what is your fatigue levels? And, and so what I want you to do and general, and this is, this is the pattern that I have them do is within an hour of waking, I want you to get up and have breakfast and, and I, I give them a template and we can change the template, but like two eggs, piece of toast and an apple. Like if they're not eating wheat, no, they're not going to eat toast. We put rice in or some, something because I don't want to suddenly drop their carbs because, because sure. of diet culture, like sometimes when you add protein, they think that we're doing a low carb diet. I'm like, we are not doing a low carb diet at this moment. You're not ready for it. Right. right. Otherwise you could experience other effects. And like, sometimes people get like keto flu types. Oh, of right. Like nothing will make a patient mad <laughs> than when they're like, Oh my God, I feel like crap. So we're keeping the carbs right where they are. We're just adding protein. So two eggs, piece of toast and apple three hours later, handful of nuts or a scoop of cottage cheese. I don't care. Uh, then a deck of cards of meat. Uh, which is three ounces is, is is twenty grams of protein if you're if you're doing meats as your pro protein source, uh, and then a salad. And again, we're looking for carb. Where's your protein? Where's your carb? Is there some fiber? Is there some fat? We want them all there. Can you identify those? And so it can be soup. It can be a sandwich. I don't I don't care whatever they're working with. But can they find twenty grams of protein at lunch? And then again, a protein snack three hours later, and then a deck of cards for dinner at bedtime. If they're waking up anxious or they're waking up sort of comatose, I have them have a little juice at waking to get. And when you're get, saying juice, like, like what kind of juice? Apple juice, just like a quarter cup. And people are like, oh my God, juice is horrible. I'm like, it's a quarter cup. Quarter cup. <laughs> like, and yeah, and if they're cutting, if they're already having more protein, they're going to be less hungry for these other things anyway. Exactly, exactly. And and I'll work with what what they're at. Like I have one one person who is like, so can I just stick my finger in the honey jar and lick it off? And I'm like, perfect. You know, the, one of the beauties of also wearing, and one day I hope that insurance companies, knock on wood, provide yeah. you know continuous glucose monitors for everybody. Uh, one of the beauties is that nothing is horrible because, right. and you know, whether you're vegan or you're vegetarian or you're doing something else, even if you're keto, but you're eating a lot of these keto products, you'll see that some of the things that raised my glucose more than anything would be keto friendly products that have, yes. Okay. They might be high fat, but they're using tapioca starch. They're using right. cassava. They're using all these yeah. things that just translate as sugar into the body. So part of that is like, I love the adapt adoption, adaptation, yeah. no, adoption. I love the adoption okay. of these monitors because it's like, 
we don't need to say that anything is kind of good or bad necessarily. Right. It's just that we're looking at the whole trend, the trend as a right. whole. And so right. you have a little bit of juice in this instance, if it works for people, who cares? It works. Right. And if you get up and, and where, where you are laying in bed and afraid to get up in the morning and just overwhelmed and you, you take a quarter cup of fruit juice and 20 minutes later, you can get up and make breakfast. Like that's worthwhile. Right. Right. That makes you functional for the, for the next step. And then other, the other pattern that I see that, that why I'm doing three hours, not everybody stays in three hours, but that first experiment does this work is sometimes people have a lot of afternoon fatigue. And generally speaking, I see the pattern that creates afternoon fatigue is people are waiting too long to have breakfast. So I want people to get up in the morning and break the fast. It's so, it's so important. And I'm so glad that you said that because one of the most popular clips that I shared recently on like Instagram was basically talking about how intermittent fasting is kind of very much a modern American construct in the way that we see it now, which is primarily skipping breakfast and then having, let's say like a big lunch and then a more moderate dinner, uh, having the pleasure of getting to know, uh, Walter Longo and his team, which has done, you know, some of the most research out there and they have the fasting mimicking diet. Uh, Joseph, who's his CEO. When I first met him, he's like, what people don't understand is that if you look around the world, especially a lot of these blue zones and places in India, the country that I'm from, when people fast and they do regularly fast for different occasions, they don't typically fast in the morning because the brain requires a lot of fuel and mental processing. They always end up eating breakfast and more traditionally, if they are going to intermittent fast, they're going to end up skipping or maybe having maybe a more moderate you know, yeah. dinner. But when you don't eat breakfast because you're following a trend, that can have implications. And a lot of people don't feel good and they just think that they're not doing it right. So I think that it's such an important thing to remind people. And I'll just toss in one more component if I could. If you are not hungry, like my fiance, sometimes in the morning, she's like, I'm just not hungry. I say, just sit outside in the sun. When you wake up in the morning, just go sit outside in the sun for a little bit. And the sun and the sun rays help reduce the level of melatonin inside your body and kind of gets the hunger going. And all of a sudden now she might feel more hungry. Yeah. That's a great tip. I, I, and I, and I'll give that a try, but the other reason why I think people are not hungry in the morning is they already have adrenaline in our system. And when the adrenaline's in our system, our digestive system is shut down. Interesting. And so the reason why I start with juice, just a little bit of juice is just to get the sugar going so that we can get out of that fight or flight response and back into our prefrontal cortex and get that, that um, vagus nerve to turn back on so that, so that we, we can get into that rest and digest kind of thing. Absolutely. And I have a quite, I wanted to follow up with something that you were saying about intermittent fasting. If that's okay, okay. Yes, please, please. Yeah. Just jump so, right into it. So I think that, I think intermittent fasting is this really interesting discussion that we're having and, and, you know, we can talk about how I, I see it helpful or not helpful with the populations that I'm dealing with. But the the research that I'm interested in on decision making it, and intermittent fasting is how is it actually affecting our decision making? Mm. Right? Because it's really hard to monitor our own decision making. And so I do a lot of public speaking for CEOs and and, and the court with judges. And there's this study, and I bet you've seen this study where they took judges. And they, um, they were reviewing files for parole. And, and, they, and they knew they were in a study and they thought they were an implicit bias study. So, of course, they were trying to be their best selves, right? And, uh, and they wanted to see how judges made different decisions based on when their last meal was. Yeah. And did you see, have you seen I this am study? I'm familiar with this. Yep. It's how stunning. punitive they were being with people. Stunning. Yeah. So for those of you who have not read the study and you can look it up on YouTube and it's on the internet, but like, so immediately after a meal, 65% of the files across all the judges were considered for parole and immediately before the meal, zero. Crazy. Crazy. And, and did those judges think that they were making different decisions? They did not. 
right? Like they thought that they were using the same criteria, but that is the difference between our responsive brain, our prefrontal cortex and our limbic system making the decisions. And, and the problem is we are not wired to really observe that difference. We're not. It's so true. And I bet all those judges would have fought tooth and nail, you know, because sometimes judges can have an ego trip of like, oh, sure. you know, we're the sort of, we're the law, we know how we see it. And obviously in this instance, the study was able to prove differently. And, you know, going along with it is that I think that the component that's there for intermittent fasting is that sometimes people hear, even on this podcast, which is why I always tell people, you have to really personalize your approach for where you're mm -hmm. at. We bring on people with a lot of different opinions. Yeah. Um, is that if you are on the carbohydrate train and roller coaster, maybe we don't want to shoot for that first. Right unless if it's an intervention that you're working on with your doctor to address a very specific thing and they're working with you, yeah. you might just be better off just balancing out your blood sugar a little bit better with by, you know, in this instance, like bringing in some protein, yeah. right. right. And right. there's, then there's the whole question about how intermittent fasting is different for men and women, especially for women in their reproductive right. years. Right. So I think wellness as a whole is going through a much more nuanced approach right. and Along with it, the conversation is how do we get this out to people who are not reading a wellness book, right. are, are not listening to this podcast? What are the interventions and tools? And one of those simple tools could be just, I even think about how many group homes or my dad previously was in the world oh, of psych yeah. psychiatric, right? Oh yeah. How many times are those kids just acting out simply because their blood sugar is all over the place because all the workers, you know, my yeah. dad was a CFO of yeah. a group of psychiatric hospitals. Yeah. You know, they would have internal, you know, not jokes, yeah. but more of an understanding of like, Oh, sh yeah. Oh shoot. You know, we yeah. need to get these yeah. folks fed. Like it's like a toddler, you know, you yeah. can see that they just had a sugar rush. That's there. Yeah. Can I share a story with please, you? Please. Yes. Tell me. So when, uh, right out of college, I worked with kids in psychiatric crisis at a, at a, uh, at a hospital diversion program. And we had this kid come in and he was like 5'11", 170 pounds worked out. And when he got mad, he put his fist into somebody's face, right? Wow. That, that is a problem, <laughs> right? And, but otherwise he was a pretty good kid, but boy, his anger was like zero to 10. Right. And so he got put in, came to us and when you come in, you like, there's all sorts of things and you're put on a behavioral plan. And this kid was just knocking it out of the park. He was getting perfect scores. The first day got a perfect score. And when you got a perfect score, you had a choice of prizes. And one of them was a Snickers bar. And two hours later, he was trying to kill us. And we, you know, restraining somebody that big was, is kind of a deal. And so next day we we're like, Hey, and did a Snickers, you know, and next day he did great. Got a Snickers bar again, like this amazing violence in the evening. So the third day I happened to be in charge and I went to, and I knew nothing about physiology. I was biology major, but knew nothing about nutrition. But I was like, I am not giving that kid a Snickers bar. <laughs> and I got him little, those little men with guns, those little, you know. Army soldiers. soldiers uh, army soldiers. I'm like, hey, army soldiers. And he's like, sure. And no problems for the rest of the night. And army soldiers the second night, no problems. Uh, the fifth night that he was there, somebody else was in charge. They gave him a Snickers bar, all chaos again. Next, next day, I was just like, so, like, what happened last night? He's like, I don't know, but I'm not eating Snickers bars anymore. I, he's like, I like getting what I want at the time, but I do not like hurting people. And Snickers bars was a problem. And that was like the first time that I was just like, you know, diet has something to do with how people behave. It so does. What a great, I mean, if he's saying that to you, what level of awareness, right? right. To, to have that. And just also you feel for people in that situation that don't know any different or don't have access to, you know, right. better quality foods. And really what I'm hearing for you is that like, if you encountered somebody like that now, you'd yeah. say, I'm not, yes. Okay. Maybe an ideal situation. We don't want him having like Snickers bar, but would it be that you might just up his 
protein throughout the day or make sure that he maybe had some protein before eating that Snickers bar? And then- uh, yes, exactly. Like what I see is, uh, you know, because I try and not have a lot of judgment about what people are eating because I work with people at all economic levels. Sure. And uh, and so what what I find is like one woman, five people in her office had birthdays in the same month. And she was just like, I cannot eat Costco cake at five, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon, five days in a row. And I was like, no problem. Like I want, I want you to get some protein and we, we got some protein and she used some turkey meat or some chicken meat. And before you go eat the, the cake, just have some protein. And that stabilized her blood glucose enough that she didn't, really struggle. It wasn't ideal, but it wasn't the big drop that she would get. And I think that hack right there for our audience, that's you know, still with us here in the podcast, that right hack right there is that we all have that situation occasionally, no matter how well you eat, right? Right. There's going to be a time where you go to a wedding, you're out somewhere, you're at a birthday party, you're meeting people, you're traveling abroad and you actually want to indulge. You want to have this thing and you want to enjoy it, right? Which yeah. you should enjoy it. It's not that you should never be eating these things. And then to simply know, it's like, if I can include some protein, maybe I'm going to be kinder and nicer to myself afterwards. Other people, I'm not going to be, to steal a term from uh, one of my friends, hypoglybitchy or <laughs> right. You know, right. angry, right? right? I'm not going to be angry at somebody else or my partner who I love because my limbic brain has taken over. I can just simply have a little bit of protein before I have that thing. And again, just to remind us in that instance about how much protein and does it vary for men and women at all? It, it, var- it varies from person to person, quite honestly, right? So some people can do like an ounce of meat and, and that's better. And some people need that full 20 grams. So it kind of depends on, on your weight, your, the, your, the, your level of roundness, uh, and, you know, are you moving towards diabetes, uh, the, the, your nutrient status over time, the amount of exercise. And so I'm always asking people to do what you were suggesting earlier is do the experiment, right? And like, just, is it, is this enough? And really, you know, it really takes a few days if you're paying close attention for you to be like, oh, this is this gets me closer in the ballpark. This this helps fifteen percent. Like if we can, you know, if some somebody is is using pan, going back to panic attacks. Like if we take twenty percent off of a panic attack, that's an eight out of ten. And at an eight out of ten, like it's still uncomfortable, but you can actually make decisions about what you're doing, and you're not just like shut down, right? I can think of a close friend of mine that is going through this probably right now that actually knows a lot about wellness. Cause it, you know, it's funny. I try to recognize my own bias and we talk about processed foods. We talk about sort of Snickers and other things like that. But in this modern world of wellness that we're in, fortunately and unfortunately at the same time is we also have a lot of wellness products that are just as starchy or sugary oh, as absolutely. anything else that's there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can get certain green juices that have just as much soda as like a Coca Cola. That are yeah. so. Absolutely. If somebody is eating even organic, but they're eating organic Oreos or they're eating, you know, right. you know, even just a lot of very highly processed starches, they can still end up in the same boat. And I can think of a friend of mine who's struggling in this category, thinks of themselves as a as a very healthy eater, but probably under eats on protein. And the other component that's there is we just finished a whole series on longevity. And as individuals get older, uh, you need protein to maintain your muscle mass, which is so important for things related to longevity. I'd love you to just chime in on that for a little bit. Is that how do you see for your parents, uh, sorry, for your patients, parents too, uh, how do you see for your patients that are, let's say, uh, 60, 70, 80, if you have any in that category of where the protein conversation fits in? Yeah. So let's talk about, so I'm going to back up and just talk about in general and then build up to that. So in general, to just stabilize mental health, what I see is people, unless they're really petite, people need to get to 65 to 70 grams of protein, which is just like straight RDA, 8.8 grams per, per kilogram or eight grams of 
protein for 20 pounds of body weight, right? And what I see is if I, and for some people, that's a stretch, depending on where you are in the wellness discussion, some people are like 70 grams of protein, that is nothing, right? And uh, because people are doing a lot higher depending on the diet that they're doing. So I like to get people to 70 grams and divided throughout the course of the day, because if you eat a 10 ounce steak at, 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 at a meal, only three or four of those ounces are going to be used for your physiology and the rest is just going to be converted to fat. So divided, divided that through the course of the day. The studies that, that I'm seeing is that, that, the, that when you start getting up to one gram per, uh, per, of protein per kilogram, a little higher than RDA, uh, HDL improves, uh, weight, waistline improves. And, and so again, as a clinician, like I work with the individual and, and, you know, changing your diet is at least a six month process, if not more. And so we're, I'm always kind of just working with them on, on, on working on their eating habits and being like, where is this to feel better? And using their stamina, particularly the aging population, their stamina to see that their protein status is improving uh, and their, their exercise tolerance is improving. Because the other thing we're doing by eating protein regularly is we're, again, protecting that muscle mass. Because what we know from quick weight loss programs, the reason why they don't work is that you just pull the protein off your body, and then you've lowered your metabolism. And so at, as people age, generally, they've done quick weight loss programs, and they're not maintain for hormonal reasons, they're losing muscle mass. And for um, sedentary reasons, they're losing muscle mass. And so I'm always working on all of those factors to keep the, the over 70 group um, improving. And I, I have had, had, you know, right now, um, I have a lot of uh, over 70 year olds who are trying to just optimize their health in my clinical practice. And it's amazing what happens when they get enough protein divided throughout the day, they, they set their sleep schedule, and, and they move their body. And like, give me six months of that, and they feel so much better. It's incredible. I want to ask you is that if somebody is actually finding themselves in a place where they can sense that a panic attack is coming on, when you are working with your patients and sort of your general recommendations, do you talk to them about in that moment eating? I do. I'm, I get them juice. It's back to that lizard brain treat. And you know, when, uh, when I was seeing people in my office and they came in, they're like, ah, ah, and I would be like, juice, nuts, like, and I would, and they would, <laughs> and like 10 minutes and you would just see their brain click in. And now that it's mostly virtual and they get on screen and they're, you can just see that they're just like struggling. I'm like, go to the kitchen, find something with sugar in it, find some protein, bring it back here. And 10 minutes. And they're like, back. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, wow, I've had a really hard day. And I'm like, yeah, I can see like, and it's just that difference between our lizard brain and our responsive brain. Like, and, and, and if we're with somebody who's panicking, like don't have a conversation with somebody who's panicking. Like it's, it's not helpful. They can't, it's not a place to be able to process it because they're thinking with a different portion of their brain. Right. And they're thinking about like everything's registering with what in the past. And so, you know, with teenagers or spouses or friends, like just get them some food and they may not be hungry, which is why I do sugar, like, uh, I, and sugar would be fine. Candy. I don't care. Candy, juice, something quick to get that adrenaline to come down and get some, some fuel to the cortex mindfulness and therapy and all those things that engage the prefrontal cortex for, th for therapy is great. But if you have enough trauma, you don't have enough neuro nets to do that. And you got to get some glucose in there first. So in the example of like you giving that patient juice or on, you know, telemedicine calls, because I do believe you still see patients and I are taking patients and we'll have your contact information in the show notes so people can reach out to you, which would be fantastic. I'd love to see some of our community working with you. 
how, how do you also, is it just juice by itself or are you also including some of the protein and fat to make sure that you don't get another situation? Exactly. Like, you know, cause my, I guess my concern is that if I'm hearing about it, knowing kind of how my glucose is mapped out through the day. And a lot of my friends that I've gotten on yeah. monitors yeah. is how do we make sure we're not just trading something in the short term for something in the long term. So you are right. also giving, you yeah. might stabilize them with some yeah. punch of something of some sugar in yeah. some cases, maybe even candy you're saying, right. but you're also trying to get them to eat some sort of protein right yeah. then or as soon as they can. As soon as the, like whatever's available. So in my office, I have juice and nuts. Yeah. Right. And, and if, uh, if they're on the screen, like I really want them to go get some honey and some peanut butter, right? Like, cause usually that's in the kitchen and we can get those. But as soon as we get off of our, that will get us through the appointment, right? Because, sure. and, and then I'm like, you have to go get a meal now. A, a real meal. Now a we're sort of putting meal, aside the because, juice, we're putting aside the candy. Right. And we're saying like, how do we actually have something that sustains and gives your body what it's looking for? Right. Because, and usually we back up on a, and once they click back in, I'm like, so when was the last time you had a meal? And they're like, oh, five hours ago. And I'm like, yeah. So the juice and nuts is going to help for a little bit, but you got to go get a meal now. And they're like, Oh, I don't have time. And I'm like, okay, a protein bar or whatever, but we got to get some more calories in so that you're not going through the loop again, particularly in this COVID moment, because everybody's going through a trauma. Everybody's exhausted. Our brains, re you know, we don't have the social resources that we used to have. And so people are a lot more sensitive to going through the sort of the, what I call the wash cycle, um, because we're not, we don't have all the things we normally stabilize off of. You have been in clinical practice. I think you said for how 15 long? Years? 15, 15 years, 15 years, yeah. 15 years as a naturopathic doctor. Yeah. And you have all these case studies and experience. And we were chit chatting a little bit before the interview started. You said, I've been like wanting to make a book out of this for a long time but it was just yeah. kind of like sitting there a little bit. And then finally you were able to like work with a friend who is good at writing and kind of, yeah. you work together, you have the protocol, yeah. they have the writing chops. Yeah. What was the decision of like, you know what? I need to give this more attention and I gotta like, I gotta do it. Like what was the final decision of like, I have to get this information out there. Yeah. So a friend of mine, um, introduced me to John Weisman, who was the department in charge of the Department of Health in at the state of Washington. And by the way, big hand of applause because he's done an amazing job with COVID. He and he just retired. And I went in and I and I basically showed him my slide deck of the talks that I do. And I'm like, here's what happens with glucose and here's what happens in your body. And and, and, you know, like feeding the brain. And he's like, this is really important. And, 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 and he actually let me talk to all of his department chairs, which was a huge honor. And, um, and the person who does finance said, uh, so mental health and diabetes is, is, is connected. And I'm like, absolutely physiologically. And, and, and he's, and he's saying, so food could help us lower the amount of psychotropic meds that we are, are using in the United States. And I'm like, absolutely. And, and then the people, the department that, that does WIC and, and SNAP just, just looked at me and they're like, we're just trying to get calories into people, like not nutrients, but calories. And I was just like, I, I need to have a book so that I don't have to be in the room for people to understand this. And so that, that, you know, I, I often think of books as sort of like a pair of glasses. It gives other people a perspective of how you see the world. Yeah, exactly. That's it's great. One of, it's one of the cheapest things that people can do to change their perspective or to at least consider a different perspective. And you never also know, you never know who's listening to this podcast. You never right. know who is going to give your book to the next person. And now right. all of a sudden you have a whole swath of people that are approaching something in what would have been considered a contrarian approach, but are actually now getting results. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about the, the book 
and uh, what people can find inside of it. Yeah, so it's called Fuel Your Brain, Not Your Anxiety. It's published by New Harbinger Publishing. Uh, just came out in February. The first chat, a couple of chapters have some assessments so that you can start to differentiate the physical symptoms of anxiety from the emotional symptoms of anxiety. And it's just a basic score scorecard so that you can do experiments and be like, hey, if I do a lizard brain treat, like what symptoms get better? And if I do three days of protein, what symptoms get better? So that you can just see the improvement. The chapter three, it goes through the physiology and there's a story of a woman going through it because physiology is horrible to re read. And so we lined up the physiology with somebody's story because we see this play, this physiology play out all the time and we just don't know it, right? Uh, and then we, there's a couple chapters on helping you figure out how to eat protein more regularly, because like, it's actually really hard to do if you haven't thought about it and, and, you know, like giving you ideas on how to do it and making sure that you have, you've planned, uh, pro high protein meals for your terrible, horrible, no good days. Cause those come with some frequency right now. And then we have a chapter on sleep and the importance of movement. And then the last chapter is a chapter on what labs uh, you should ask your primary care physician to do. Because although we've been talking a ton about nutrition, the other piece that's getting dropped regularly is, the, is nutrient deficits and hormonal uh, challenges that, that look like anxiety or look like fatigue or look like depression that really are just core physiological problems. Mm, powerful. This has been an incredible conversation. And uh, I just want to say like, thank you for coming on and sharing what I think would be a very different idea that maybe not everybody in our audience has heard, but I really want them to consider, especially if they are dealing with symptoms of anxiety, wherever they fall in, uh, in the spectrum. So Dr. Kristen Allett, Thank you so much. And if you could share where people could keep in touch with you, find the book, we'll have all those links in the show notes, but for those yeah. that are driving right now or sort yeah, of yeah. listening while they're working out, what's your website and are you yeah. active at all on social media? So, uh, Dr. Kristen Allett, so, uh, .com is my website. Uh, I also have a website proteinforall.org, which is working with low income populations. Um, the there's social media links on there. We're just getting more organized around that, quite honestly. So join our newsletter. That's sort of the best place um, for now. And uh, I thought you asked me another question and I can't find it. So <laughs> I'll just, I'm starting to get hypoglycemic, I bet. Uh, <laughs> and uh, oh, and so, yeah, so people can find us that way. Uh, I am in clinical practice, but the state of license, uh, my license is uh, restricted to the state of Washington. So even during uh, COVID, you can't do telemedicine. I've seen some states sort of ease up on restrictions during COVID. That is true. And I am a child of lawyers and I'm going to, I'm going to assume that that rule is going to go back. And because, because I, uh, because often the populations that I have in clinical practice are pretty vulnerable. And I don't, I don't have an easy, like, Oh, you can't see me. So go see this person. Mm. Uh, I have decided to keep my licensure uh, within the state of Washington, but buy the book, join, join our, uh, our community through our email newsletter. We, we do, um, we do, we do connectors meeting where people can come and ask questions. Uh, there's lots of ways to connect to me through, through my speaking engagements. I do a lot of speaking engagements. And so that, that would be the best way to connect to me. Uh, and outside. if there is anybody that's listening that would love to work with you, do you do any sort of like wellness consulting where you're like, look, I'm not your doctor, but this is a wellness consult. It's not like an appointment. Uh, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I do for mental health professionals who are like, I have this client Okay, and we, we do one-offs. Yeah. Those kind of things. Fantastic. Well, uh, the book is a great place for people to start and we'll have the link to it in the show notes and congratulations again on putting it out yeah. there. And and it was a pleasure. To yeah. You Thank you so much, Drew. This has been an amazing interview. I really have had a lot of fun. <laughs>